before we get started, I'd like to thank our donors for their wonderful support. I'd like to thank the Gertz Gallery Advisory Board. And I'd also like to thank the Parkland College Administration for their support, as well as Donna Gertz, for whom the gallery is named, and her husband, Fred. I would be remiss not to mention how thankful we are to the Illinois Arts Council, uh, a state agency, for their continued support that we receive through grant funding. It also allows us to do events like these that are free and open to the public. Uh, I'd also like to thank Waylena, who's here. Uh, she's our guru here at the um, planetarium, and she's been helping us with all the tech aspects, as well as Cindy Smith, who has helped me so many times with Facebook and all of these Zoom webinars. So thank you both, couldn't do it without you. Um, Gertz Gallery serves as a platform to exhibit contemporary art. We are a learning laboratory for our students, and it's critical that we exhibit and host programming that features professional artists so that faculty can use the gallery as an instructional resource, and our students in the community can experience the work in person and hear artists speak about their process and their artistic journey. This exhibition and this talk, Better Angels, works by Stephen Hudson, accomplishes our goals. Stephen is a local artist and uh, with national stature. I remember when I moved back to Champaign-Urbana and meeting him over 20 years ago, uh, we talked about art, philosophy, and our life experiences. And it's been remarkable to see his work develop over the years. And we are honored to have this exhibition um, of his work in the gallery, as well as have this talk here today. Originally from Massachusetts, he completed his undergraduate work at UMass Dartmouth and went on to complete his master's degree at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Stephen taught briefly at Parkland College and it was a delight to have him here as a colleague. Uh, he currently serves as a teaching associate professor at the University of Illinois. Just like many of the faculty in the art and design department at Parkland College, both students and colleagues tend to take our faculty for granted, and that's because they're so accessible and down to earth. I see Denise Seif here and Melinda <laughs> McIntosh, uh, and they're so generous with their time. But the reality is that we are in the presence of real talent and knowledgeable faculty that make an impact on our lives. I know this is true with Stephen as well, because I've had many alumni contact me, um, and they're so thrilled that he has work in the show. So um, I'll have to put you in contact with some former students from Parkland. Uh, so anyway, let's uh, get started and let's give a warm welcome to Stephen Hudson. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. It's great to be back here at Parkland. Oh. So um, well, I'll get started. I have a lot of images to show you, and I, I thought I, I was wondering what to do, and I decided to kind of, I remember being an undergrad and um, I, I'm trying to kind of imagine, you know, people starting out in terms of uh, kind of investigating the arts and uh, uh, becoming involved with that. And uh, for me, it was super important. Like, it's such a great opportunity. I grew up on a farm and, uh, and you know, not a lot of culture, but luckily the people I was around uh, they weren't, weren't really, I, I could do what I wanted. They, they let me kind of explore whatever I wanted to do. And I I, I started out very humbly because I like to draw. That's what I did. I was a kid. I like to draw. And uh, that uh, drawing, it, it's a craft. And, and uh, it was like a, something I like to do, a predilection is the way I communicated. Uh, but it turned into so much more. And I think, you know, being involved in the humanities is such an opportunity. You, you have this little thing that you do and all of a sudden that you get in touch with culture and, and philosophies and, and different people and it grows into so much more and and for myself I, I, I it's been an amazing journey so uh, as I put these uh, slides together I've started like in undergrad right these are like my first things I did and uh, I was looking back and thinking with Lisa that I, I do the same things. Like the things I liked then are the things I like now. They're in different contexts and they're, they're but I, I used to like animals and I, I, I did this etching, this etching of a, of a fox. And uh, I did this from memory. I didn't look at a thing. I kind of looked at animals, you know, so it's kind of funky. It's probably looks more like a wolf, but it was supposed to be a fox. And then like trees and we, where I lived, they were swampy and the trees would fall over and the roots would stick up and stuff. So, so I just remember all this stuff in the snow. So just kind of imagine, imagine drawing. So hopefully this will work. Um, I did still lifes. You know, you all do still lifes. Why do a still life? I remember the assignment. The, student, the instructor said, make it interesting. 
set it up in an interesting way. Because I never, you know, I drawing, but then what, what, what are you drawing about or how do you draw it? How do you make it interesting? So in terms of, uh, like I always tell students dealing with creativity, it doesn't have to be a lot. They just say, well, that's a little bit surprising, you know, and that's enough. That's an inroad to start to create visual interest and conceptual interest. So I was into looking and seeing. So I set this thing up and I, I, I remember I hung it on fishing wire and I put a light on it. And I wanted the still life to float. I said, no one else in the class is going to do that. <laughs> so that, that little spark, you know, your instructor sometimes will give you an assignment. But then I always tell my students, like, I didn't tell you not to do that. I said to do this, this, and this, but I didn't say you couldn't put color in it. <laughs> so I kind of, I think that's a good kind of perspective as an artist uh, uh, to, to have that little angst, angst of doing a little bit more of surprising someone. And sometimes it's not a, a dramatic, intense conceptual gesture but my paintings now i do animals i do still lifes because there's objects in them and i do landscapes so that's what i did and now i stick them together in different ways so this is like a landscape painting where i take the easel out and, and i remember uh, parking the car by the side of the road and painting this is a salt marsh where i grew up there's kind of marshes this is where I grew up. It's a greenhouse. We stored the equipment in there in the winter time, and it was a warm place because my house was very cold. And the greenhouse was always warm when it was a sunny day, and we had all the tractors parked there. So I just put a canvas there, and I painted this. I painted it on site. And, uh, it, in school, uh, it, it, I learned how to do perspective. I didn't know how to do perspective, but I was uh, uh, took classes, and they said, "Oh, you put a vanishing point here, and then you take all these tools that you learn and you, you gather them together, and you can add them all up." So, so kind of a big, big painting, kind of industrial in a, in a grid. Figure drawing. I, I had a lot of trouble drawing figures. Figures are hard to draw, and they're complex, curvilinear things, and uh, and, and I think as an artist, every once in a while, you figure something out, you have like a breakthrough piece. And when I did this pastel, I couldn't paint the figure. I couldn't figure out how to mix the colors. But when I fragmented the colors with pastel, it made it much more easier. So I had this, this one drawing I did. I learned how to do other, other things and other paintings. So I'm kind of giving you, a, at this point, a timeline of, of just the, the, my progression. Then this represents graduate school. Graduate school is a different thing. My undergrad, we were very formal. I learned how to, how to mix paint and perspective and, and look and observe. But then in graduate school, it was conceptual. And like, why are you making images? And that was a hard, it was like a void. I didn't know what to do because I could look at something and draw it. But I didn't know why I was doing that. So, so I, I think the opportunity of grad school is to kind of give your, your artwork a purpose or see it in a broader context or context of how, how you engage with the ideas and society. It's a bit of an existential void. Like, I don't know what to do. This piece represents that because this is a bar game where you flip these posters up and you catch them. I don't know. I did a figure. I wanted to do some kind of frivolous. So just a, a funny thing. But uh, I, I started to do a lot of charcoal drawing and, and I was, became much more interested in the figure. But I didn't want to, like in this case, the portraits of, averted, which I still do. I don't, I didn't want it to be involved in the, uh, the uh, personality. I just, it's just a movement and something that took place. Uh, I did a series later uh, of uh, little prints. So, so this is what leading up to what I do. I, I did these nudes, and this is the first time I kind of did nudes in my artwork that, that weren't just figure drawings. I was trying to put them in context, and I had them be people doing their laundry, and they're kind of naked. And the, the idea being if you, you, you do that, all your clothes could be clean at one time. So there's like some you've achieved that. <laughs> Maybe that's something to achieve. <laughs> so I was having fun with like marks and stuff like a swirl for the laundry. And I was trying to figure out visual language and just kind of gesture, quickly writing stuff down. I like this work still. So it's really quick stuff. These are lithographs with a lithographic crayon, little sketches. They took 10 minutes. Some touche wash for those printmakers. Yeah, I don't do it anymore. But I did. And this started the, the work that you see now. In graduate school, I started to work with this idea of an expulsion from Eden. And I, I said, well, I'm going to do these nudes. And uh, I, I was kind of secularizing them. I'm saying that, that they're, they're being 
they're kind of exposed and they're they're vulnerable there as we gain understanding uh we we, we really gain about how much we we, we don't understand so you, you get cast into this what is knowable what's possible to know and can we know stuff is there a purpose to things and so these these uh these uh, figures always represent that kind of stark existentialism, not of death, but of, of unknowing, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the vacuum of, of understanding that we all confront at some point. It's, uh, and that's really an analogy to graduate school. I've kind of come to understand too as well. So these figures are bleak. And uh, I've drawn the figure. These are done from my imagination. I did a lot of figure drawings. So I started to learn anatomy. I represented it in my own way. They're stylized or um, they would be, uh, I'm blanking here a little bit. I'll unblank. But uh, the, 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 uh, the, the backgrounds are just kind of suggestive, just the space and the figures aren't, aren't in any context. All, you, all the interpretation comes from the, uh, the figure and their gesture. And again, I'm kind of taking the, the faces away. The mannerism was the word I was trying to get. They're a bit mannerist. I've decided to contort the figure in some kind of way. It's not realism exactly. So I was uh, very influenced by this uh, Masaccio. So I'll show it in this expulsion scene. And uh, so that was uh, kind of uh, like, it's so simple, so sculptural. It's not realism but it, it's more communicative. We, we see this gesture and the people are like actors. And I was very interested in that. So I did this for my graduate thesis. As a graduate student, we, we had a show. I was very fortunate in my uh, school. We had a full ex exhibit with a gallery for each student. Uh, and so I had to put a show together and this was the biggest piece in it. It was a big uh, expulsion, kind of Adam and Eve and uh, it has gold leaf and paint, and it was like really big. For some weird reason, I made it 66 by 99 inches. I don't know why. Just wanted it to be some something. Well, a pretty epic piece. I ended up making a big frame for it. And, and I, I was very fortunate. I, 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 after uh, my uh, graduate show, I, I got picked up with a gallery and uh, kind of randomly, the, the world is that way. Uh, somehow, someone saw something and and then I was there, and uh, so I, I was able to, in Chicago, paint for quite a while and just do paintings. And I had, you know, periodic exhibits of these. I took that uh, idea of the expulsion and I started to change it and sort of had these bleak uh, environments with these figures kind of interacting, sort of, and uh, very stage-like. So in my art, I'm always interested in it not being real, that it's an act of communication. And um, I'm trying to step outside of that and say it's a, it's, a, it's a dialogue rather than a, a realism. So I'm always kind of aware of that. It's like a play, like a stage. In my statement, I say it's a, a Dadaist play. And I, I feel like my work is always that. There's like a confrontation. And I started to incorporate uh, objects of our time in my world. So, I, you know, I, I made a world. All of a sudden, since I started doing it, it becomes my place. And uh, in my world then, now I was allowing objects. <laughs> so I had these uh, kind of traffic things, which are menacing. And uh, I've always been interested in the, again, since I started out with landscapes, I'm fascinated by clouds and I'm always looking around and I, these things which are wondrous to me. I'm, in, in a way, I'm, I'm trying to communicate things which are important, but also I, I look at things which fascinate me. Like uh, in terms of important, I'm, I'm kind of always like a humanist. I'm interested in the human condition and our vulnerability. So that's what I, I am communicating itself. So it's a, an appreciation for some things, but also, you know, uh, how fragile things are. And there's a, like elements of humor, because I think humor is important. So there's a kind of a beauty, but also kind of funny, like goofy things. My artwork becomes autobiographical because these are the things I was around. I had a can opener and that's a can. And these are things I see around my house. So like our, our, I, I didn't try to, I mine the every day for, for content. And uh, in, yeah, I kind of painted obs obscurely. I'm not trying to necessarily narrate. But it's like a domestic scene to some sense. These objects, TV, kind of glowing. Same as my painting now. I, I do the same thing. So there's a kind of the, in a hot spot, there's this kind of bit of technology there the person's interacting with, kind of aloof. 
very misty scene. So these are some pretty big paintings. The kind of domestic intranquility. There's always the, the sense of the apocalypse, which I, I used to sort of draw attention to, uh, again, the uh, fragility of now and kind of a distancing and distancing. We all have our lives and we have our bills and our responsibility and our the things that we perform. But, but at the same time, there's these other times where you pause and you're estranged from that and you wonder, what, what are we all doing? So my paintings are doing that a bit. They get kind of absurd. Uh, these are kind of violent and uh, kind of ugly, you know, and visceral. At this point, I was interested in like you see the veins and you know, so, oh, how, how do you describe the figure? There's different ways. So you can describe the skin, the flesh tone, but then you can kind of penetrate that and maybe imagine other things. So I was uh, uh, kind of working with that as well, I believe. And the figures became, uh, I mentioned them, um, mannerisms and my mannerisms changed. The figures got heavier, bulkier, thicker. I was always wanting them to be very heavy, like they're present and they're kind of projecting into the space, like they're there as, as bodies. This is weird. That looks like Bill Murray. I wasn't trying to do Bill Murray, but I mean, it really looks like Bill Murray. I got to see if he's interested in it. I still own it, I think. But uh, the objects are real, so it's a small painting. And I still, the, in the paintings now, I haven't been doing that for a while, but I decided to go back and, and do those editions of collage. So to me, it's like another aspect of realism. You could paint it or it could really be there. So it's kind of hovering in between the, the, the way we can uh, kind of communicate, I suppose. It's a really big painting, super weapon. It was during the Gulf War, and uh, I, I uh, was interested in this uh, kind of just brutality and absurdity. Uh, so I was getting that across. This was in the uh, Chicago Art Expo one year, and it was above the food court. So people were trying to eat. There's this giant painting there. <laughs> I don't, that would be a, that was a good moment for me. So some of like, the actual phone, which is like from a long time ago, there's not those phones now, but I stuck the whole phone on. So sometimes the assemblage would get kind of pretty intense. And then I, I, uh, this is, I think, when I was teaching here at Parkland, I started to kind of morph the figure. So like I've been doing figure drawing and, and like they change and I was saying, well, here's a possibility. What if I can take the figure instead of drawing two arms and two legs and like a normal figure, I can start to kind of collage the figure together and to open up more kind of uh, um, expressive possibilities. You can see the painting style changed. It's really tightly painted, really uh, uh, blends. I was looking back at the Renaissance and going back and looking at those great painters and that, that, that undulating uh, uh, curvature of the, the forms and the lighting. I became very fascinated by that. So I, I, I changed and, and went back and, and did some, some of these, which are kind of haunting. I like these though. So. And I was taking the figure and kind of taking the inside out. And there, there, there's a, like a horror here, but also a beauty. Like I was really fascinated with the sensuality uh, of that, uh, uh, of that possibility and the color and the design and the things I could do. So these are kind of intense, very, these are very small paintings and very, uh, very like intensely painted in detail. And uh, you can see the paintings I'm doing now, very big marks, but these are very, very tight. I think it's good, like I was telling some students earlier, there's not one way to paint, there's not one way to express it here. I, I like to think it is, what do I want to do now? How do I want to talk about this apple? You could paint an apple very many different ways and it could mean completely different things. It's your the interaction of the, the language and the context that start to create the, the nexus of the meaning or interpretation. Oops, what did I do? I shut something off. Creepy. This is from uh, Da Vinci, the last, the Mona Lisa, right? <laughs> the background. I, I was looking at it. It's weird. If you ever look at that painting, look at the background. It's so intense. He painted that over many years, I think. I would ask to do so. A painting at that time. I like this painting. It's conversation. It's really dark, visceral. Again, that existential void of space figures are there. We don't know where they are. 
And I showed some of these at Carpenter back in the day. These are quick charcoal studies. Gone from my imagination. So I've done a lot of figure drawing. I was able to do, do these. This is like environmental um, uh, pesticide. And it's like a dead bug, kind of upside down. <laughs> it's like performance. I'd say they're like actors. A kitty. I, I try to work with an elegant gesture. So as I'm working with the figures, I'm always very visual. I'm trying to say, what kind of shape do I want to make? And how's that shape? Inputs and mood, how simple can I make it? I pair things down. There's a big drawing. This is a, done, uh, the work that's in the show now, this is a sister piece to it, same scale. So very similar to the one with the Tasmanian hydra in it, same time. So that's one of the older works. I did a series of small paintings with them. Um, at this point, what started to happen more is I started to be more conscious of environmentalism and that became a, a, a concern of mine. And so I started to integrate these animals into my world, like before I added the uh, artifacts, but now these animals come and interact. And these two are like mimicking one another. I use these plastic cups a lot because they're nice forms. It's kind of a thing. It's like you have sometimes you have a little, I don't know, it's a identifier of things that I do in my work. A beluga whale. Sorry, buddy. A kind of helping gesture. I, I, I look at all the paintings and I'm always mystified by like the painters and they can show light in a painting. So that's always a fascination, something I want to show. I, I like uh, in oil paint, I like the, uh, the intrigue and the mystery and the wonder uh, of of representing light and it's just paint it's colored mud and you can move it around and you can make these things happen so to me it's a bit of like a i try to be a, i try to show off a little bit things you can do so i live in illinois and like my, my landscapes are flat because it's flat around here and so i it made it easier it's easier to paint flat so it's good but yeah we have these vistas and the the fields get flooded. And the ground plane is kind of white, you'll see. I, I, do, I have it get white at the foreground because it's a spatial device. It helps it advance. And I don't know how to conceptualize it. I imagine it as a bleached surface of the earth. It's kind of, I don't know. What time is it, Lisa? I got 10 minutes left? I got to go fast. All right. Sorry. Sorry to break in. I broke the third wall. So this is a companion piece to that, uh, to that piece with that Tasmanian tiger. I use those because they're extinct and they were extinct in our time period. And I think it's tragic that they, such a marvelous thing, was discarded by us. So it's kind of timely piece that may happen yet. We'll see that coming. There's a dilemma in my work because some of the stuff is happening. Like before I was like kind of trying to uh, warn people but now it's like taking place so i don't know what to do now i'm a bit at a conceptual dilemma this this happens this will happen this is irony the sea turtle then the cat playing with the baby sea turtle that's pretty dark and then someone documenting it it's like that's the time we're out i'll just kind of take a photo of it and maybe i, I can feel better about it the, the landscape kind of red, like there's fire, which happened. California burned up beautiful photographs, menacing. Oh, oh this, uh, this stuff. So I, I divided my talk up into kind of three sections. That was kind of a survey of my art. I stopped there because the other works from the show. So this was work kind of from when I was in school leading up to, up to the work that's in the show. This is a big sculpture that I did, and I was going to show you that a little bit about process. So I, I, uh, I showed up my gallery and uh, they were going to give me a show. And the gallery director, who is bizarre, said, Steve, I'll give you a show, but um, I want you to do some sculpture. I want you to do a little jazz up the painting. Do a couple of big sculptures. And you got two weeks. And uh, <laughs> so what I did was I said, I'm going to do, yeah, all right. I'll get it done. All right. So, so that's it. You know, as an artist, you got to deal with deadlines and, and the reality of a lot of stuff. So I, I said, well, conceptually, I like figures. They, da, 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 they, 
the gestures and space. Great, great, great. How to do it. So I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to make sculpture. But the thing is, you can kind of try to do it. Uh, you figure out whatever you know how to do. So I said, well, I'll make paper mache because that's light and fast. And so that's what I did. I said, oh, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it. And uh, I wanted them light because I wanted them to float in the air and uh, be around. So. so here's my studio. This is two weeks from, from, from getting the idea to having it in a truck there. So I work day and night. And I, I, uh, I tell people when I had to get a hammer, I ran and I got the hammer and I brought it back. And uh, so I did. I just kind of made an armature of wood. I got some foam, stuck it on there, tied it up in my studio. And I got paper mache. I didn't know how to do paper mache. I looked on the internet. And then I ended up mixing glue and uh, uh, cornstarch and flour. I just felt like flour would be good. And I stuffed that in there and it stuck and it's still there. It still lives. And I just kind of rested it on the armature. And as uh, I haven't done sculpture, but if you learn how to draw and you learn how to work with form, and you learn how to work with gesture, you can do a sculpture because it's the same thing. You're just, you're drawing in space. And uh, so I, I was, uh, I felt like I could do it. And I did it. I just kept going. I did two figures. And here's one getting to near completion. And I had to figure out technical things, how to anchor them and put supports under. The paper wouldn't stay down. So I had to stick it with toothpicks until it dried because it was kept unfolding. So I got some, I figured it out. I figured out how to do it. And uh, this gory looking thing. And there's elastic bands because the paper was coming apart. But eventually it stuck down. And these are the two figures. It's kind of fun. This the installation of the, the works in Chicago. And they were neat. It was a neat thing to do. It's a great experience. I absolutely made no money. I made these things. I still own them. And that's part of being an artist. It was more important for me to create an energy and be part of something. And uh, the money thing was like this. It's neither here nor there. There's an opening. A lot of people there kind of checking this stuff out. It's kind of fun. My son on the bottom many moons ago. So uh, this is the last set of slides. We're doing good, Lisa? Yeah, doing good. yeah. I, I thought I'd show you the process of making that deer painting similar. So this is like, where, where do you go? I had an idea I wanted to do this big painting. It was an epic painting. It was tragic in terms of like these animals, which I like deer and they're American animals. So it's our place, our, our area. And then I did this kind of apocalyptic sky there without figures. They're just being kind of banished from, from their, their environment. So I, I, I hadn't painted or drawn deer. So the first thing I had to do is figure out how to draw a deer. I mean, I draw a lot, but as I draw figures, I, deer are hard to draw. They gesture, they're, they're, they're things. I had to do a lot of research. I did research, research, research. Uh, the drawings in my sketchbook. I was going to have a baby deer, fawn. I guess that's what they're called. And uh, these are some pictures. Here's a gesture of the all the deer together somehow. Uh, so I draw pretty abstractly sometimes, try to get ideas together. Working out more gestures of the deer. How are they going to fit together? What shape do I want? What kind of mood do I want to project? What, the gestures would uh, speak of their uh, how they're are if they're alert or if they're fleeing if they're relaxed and i went to chicago and saw the wonderful dioramas and photographed them i knew they were there but i didn't have photographs i went on a trip to photograph these dioramas specifically to get a feel for them i wanted to draw the deer very realistically because i didn't want to have them be uh, stylized i wanted them to look real not uh, monumental not heroic just deer they're out there they're walking around there what they are. Right. Got all sorts of photographs. So these are like one tenth of the research photographs that I used. These are, I did a lot. I did a lot of drawing, and particularly the legs and feet and hooves, how they are. I wanted them feeding, so I had them down. I had to look at the anatomy because the elbows and that are different. You know, their wrists are way up here, you know, so it's a whole different shape than where, where they have a bony projection on their hunch there. Uh, it's important with their, their look and the square front that they have. So these are things I learned about deer from doing this. I, if I drew a deer, I would sort of make something that looked like a deer, but I wanted it to be more. I did Photoshop maquettes of, of images from all over the place. And uh, 
this Photoshop in the back. So I do a lot of Photoshop. And I did a drawing. And the drawing's in the show there. This is the beginning of that drawing. So there's a little fawn there that was taken out. And there it is taken out. The head of the deer in the front is very low. That was changed. It's higher now. This is a, a Photoshop where I put the two clusters together for the painting. So I wanted to see how I'd fit that drawing on the painting on different composition and design. You can see some selection on the middle there. And here's the painting projected. I projected it and I did a study on charcoal and then a wash and then I'll paint into that. So I used a digital projector. And here's the painting roughed in. This is a different painting. Well, it's the same painting. I painted it twice. So this is the first version. It took me a summer. Then I destroyed it and I painted it again because I didn't like it. I didn't like the background. I thought it was too dark and I didn't like the feel. And so I painted the whole painting again. I restretched the canvas and uh, I made this a different document with uh, the drawing and then a tree at an angle. I turned it red. Had an assault weapon. This was during Columbine. Or there was a school shooting every week when I was doing this painting. So I wanted to incorporate that in some way, put our presence there. And this is the second version of it. Roughed in. And then a, a detail. I don't know. These are feet because you can't see feet of deer. So I Googled deer crossing roads because they were in the grass. <laughs> and you got to figure out how to solve a problem. How do you get a picture of a deer feet? I did drawings of horses for a gesture. And they're like deer, they're similar. And in the sketchbook. The details of the painting nearly done. The collage at the bottom, which I did last. I wanted to paint this painting very fast, have it be like a gestural drawing. So I was really conscious of the brushwork. I was telling students, it looks fast, but I might have painted that painting fast three times or painted that mark. I wanted it to look effortless, but it, it's usually everything but every once in a while. So this is the first version of the painting. It's different now. You can see there's a hand gun to the right and a, the water's different. I changed it for the show at Parkland. I repainted it. it took a few weeks. I, I redesigned the front of the painting. You may notice. So this isn't exactly it. Well, that's it. I don't know what how to make it light in here back again. But uh, yeah, hopefully that was kind of interesting. And uh, again, I just try to give you a survey. I was really interested at Parkland at just kind of showing people a process. And that's a Kind of painting, it's creative, but part of the creativity is is, is practice and hard work. Yeah. It's gratifying, but it, it, like creativity isn't just this this energy that you have kind of floating out there. I, I like to be ready because once in a while you do get this kind of inspiration, this energy. It's good to uh, kind of have things. You're working on something. You can't expect it every minute, and then you hopefully you're working when it does happen. You know, comes and goes. Even the artwork, some artwork I like more, some some like. Excuse me, I like less. So. Um, does anybody have any questions? I can kind of run around the room and see if anybody has anything. Great. All right. Melissa? Um, have you noticed more interest in your work recently because of the apocalypse seems upon us and no, there's a lot of it in movies? I don't know. And stuff. Out. I don't know. No, I can't, I can't really answer. I, I don't know anything specifically. Yeah, there's a lot of other people on this, on this gig now. So <laughs> I had that, had that little niche market for a while, but yeah, yeah, it's just timely at least, you know, so. Again, my apocalypse is kind of a friendly apocalypse. I'm trying to recoup some beauty. Like it's not just skeletons and uh, on stuff. It's 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 an irony. You know? uh, it's it's what we're losing that I, I mourn a little bit and celebrate. I guess I try to make it a beautiful apocalypse. Oh. I, I don't know. I got I got I need an agent. So <laughs> if you want to sign me up, but uh, it's, it's hard. It's hard to be an artist and teach and then be a promoter. So if I had a, if I, I, I get so involved in doing the art and I love it 
and I, I tend to get less involved in promotion. But truth be told, if I was out, I had some kind of marketing scheme, probably there'd be a place. And I, I think you're correct. LA is more figurative and uh, more interested in this kind of work than New York and other markets. But uh, it's hard to get it out there. So I, it's hard to answer that. No, I've not. I've had work exhibited in New York, but not a show. I've had in collections, though, so people have bought it from there. But I primarily, just because of demographics, I like to stay close to home, and I've always been showing in Chicago. It's just that's where I am, so I don't venture out. What was Peter Miller a long time, but they closed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm on the. I'm a free agent. I'm teaching a lot now. I've learned some things that, um, of course, the art history side of things. And I still remember conversations that we had in the office about like Rembrandt and light in the dark. And, and I still listen to that and hear that in my own head when I'm teaching and stuff. And I liked like the, the drawing that you have of the deer. Um, I saw that right away when I walked into the gallery and I saw it and I had a, a reminiscent of our conversations. Um, I also really appreciate the sketchbook that's in the gallery um, and having the opportunity to look through the sketches like yeah. that. Um, it, there's, the work always resonates um, and it always has that sense of history, but as you say, really yeah. bringing it into the here and now as yeah. well. Um, and I just, uh, it's really great to see it again in our space. Thanks. Well, our history is real important. I mean, when I was a student, to get the big picture and, and see how, how, how art was connected to societies, how the images changed based on the, on the cultures and the time and the philosophy, these things mirror one another. They're products of their time. Even if it's unintentional, uh, they, just, they just bespeak of. Of, of the concerns of the societies and the people that made them. So it's really a picture into humanity and, and time and evolution of, of philosophy. It's hard now. I grew up Renaissance to modern, and now we're in such a postmodern era that that timeline is a foreign thing almost. But I, I still cling to it, and I like that there's some kind of progression. I wonder what, what time we're in now. It's a, it's a hard one. But yeah, art history is, is uh, I, I know it may be not fun to remember those dates, but, but just look at the pictures. Can you talk a little bit more about the figure in your work and how you present them? Like, I always find it really curious, like in some of your works from, I think, the 90s, you have a group of people, but none of them are looking at each other or sometimes some one sitting on another person almost as if they're a chair yeah what can you talk a little bit more in depth well, about that again I, I don't want them to be portraits of individuals so i kind of want them to be just a just like a glimmer of someone in a shadow where you sometimes you see someone and you see their gesture but you don't know who they are and you don't know what they're doing and you're using that gesture to kind of analyze so they're very sculptural i'm a formalist so i'd be looking at anatomy and curves and gestures and the undulation of volumes and space so I, there's a kind of a distancing there where i'm not getting involved in a deep penetration of someone's uh, uh, kind of biography or, or that i'm really aloof i'm really looking at the figures from a distance i see them sculpturally and again i'm only trying to capture the the most uh, like like energy or, or the mood of, of these things and i do present the figure a little bit like a prop a little bit like a still life like you said there's a someone sitting on another person. Part of that is absurdity. I like the idea of the absurd. So I'm going to be going there. But as well, we're, we're, we're intellects and we're objects. So there's a kind of a dualism there. That, it also that, kind of reminds me of like how people are supported by one another. Yeah, and exactly. So there's kind of I a, did that a psychological exactly. yeah, absolutely. thing happening with yeah, those With pieces. the figures carrying one another, the two figures become one figure. And yeah, yeah. So very interested in that. Yeah. I've always have been. Any, any other questions? I have one more. Um, oh, it looks like there are some on the thing. I'll ask you while I'm looking at the computer to see what questions were asked. But I was curious, you mentioned that the one animal went extinct during our time. How did you decide on that? I mean, I think there have been other animals that have become extinct. Well, that one's just so striking. It's mysterious. It's cool yeah, looking. So, so part of my, my <laughs> artwork is like, I like that looking thing. And uh, I, I, I think they're interesting 
because there might be some blob like thing that maybe isn't fun to draw yeah yeah, yeah. Gonna, all right sorry <laughs> but I mean it's really amazing that you went to the field museum and drew those deer and you did research yeah, like you that do it. and so, it's hard it's like I wanted it yeah. to look a certain way so that the, the feeling that I had and what I wanted to achieve I knew I had to do it it's just a part of the project yeah and I, I it would be less if I didn't and it wouldn't be what I was trying to get at so the, the meaning I was trying to get them to be very very real like we would see them again not monumentalized like if you see pictures of deer they're kind of puffed up and stuff and when you actually see deer they're kind of they're bedraggled and they're, they're they're things which are living an existence at, at at peril in our 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 place they get hit by cars or they're hunted they're 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 you know they they, they fill in the cracks wherever they can so they're they're uh, you know they're very very docile and, and fragile you know so yeah. I wanted to get that and I wanted it to be critical and it look very real. If there's some deer person that knew what deer looked like, I wanted that audience to say, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's correct. That's the real thing. That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I've got a question here for you. It says um, it's by BC. Do you have live models for your figures or do you pose them and then paint from photographs? How do you do it? I, I do a mixture, but mostly I, I've drawn so many of, uh, uh, figures from taking figure drawing classes and I copy uh, drawings and I, uh, I've, I've learned kind of to invent a figure sculpturally, but I do to update my uh, knowledge and change the figure. I will look at references as needed. I love to do figure drawing. I'm going to move into, if I do work with the figure being more individuals and portraits actually. So in the show, there's a self-portrait that is, is, it sort of looks like me. I wasn't totally getting into that, but I, I want to start to, I think, paint individuals mm -hmm. that are specific people. Any other last questions? But, uh, yeah, so it's a various sources drawn together. I tend to do that. Yeah. And then memory. What yeah. other, you had mentioned some painters, but what other artists are you influenced by, do you think, in your work? Mm, that's a hard one. I, it changes from day to day. But uh, I guess if we go back in time, a big player is Goya. And if you've studied Goya, I mean, my figures are right out of that, pretty much. Those uh, black paintings and uh, the visceralness and the heaviness of the figures and the lack of detail. And uh, he, he as well paints characters. They're not individuals. They're, they're like uh, his character that he can kind of animate into a thing. Like uh, like a manga character, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like I can draw this figure. There it is. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I kind of bounce around. I kind of bounce around. I like um. I'll have to get the name of Ford. They paints the animals. Um, Will Ford, Joseph Ford. I'm trying to think of the name. I can, sorry, I'm bad with names. But there's a, a a painter who paints these animals. His last name's Ford. And a beautiful contemporary painter paints in watercolor and paints these hor horrific mystical scenes of animals. And they are one of my favorite painters of this particular time. But I look at all kinds of art. Like I, I look at conceptual art and look at modern painting. And uh, uh, I, I just look at it all. I do certain things. I admire people that work in a way that I don't because I do my thing but the, there's things I can't do and I, I'm like I'm in awe of these these other artists so I have like a very eclectic taste and it kind of moves moves the gambit a bit Walton Ford thank you Walton thank you. Ford that was my lifeline yeah, Ford. That was an etching. So it was a, a line etching with aquatint. So to do the toning. So that was the assignment, line etching with aquatint. <laughs> I remember. So it looks like a little snowy. Uh, but that was a property of the aquatint. But yeah, I, I really like uh, printmaking. I like the process and uh, art, the democratic medium. You can make prints and hand them out and give them to people. Um, but it's, they're, they're really tactile. Everything, of course, is reversed, so it gets mysterious. You're drawing, and it's backwards, and you print it in some other way. <laughs> I was impressed when I saw your pre presentation. I guess I, because you're such an amazing draftsman and can draw anything, I was surprised to see you using 
uh, Photoshop and kind of working things out. It's a great tool. I yeah. resisted. Can a you long talk time. a little bit about that with our students? Well, you know, if you draw or paint something like that first painting that I abandoned the deer because I painted the background, I didn't like it. The, the canvas will only absorb so much treatment and the grain fills and you can't really paint over it. And it takes a long time to change your mind and move things around. And so, so Photoshop is, a, is a, just a time saver and you draw with it. You can scale something and I do a lot of design. And I, I think as an artist, we're already working hard enough. If you can get, you can cut a corner. I could have drawn that deer painting on the canvas, but heck, wow, <laughs> I, I could position it. And so, so these technical things, I don't think you should feel like I, I know some people are, I, I would feel like, oh, I'm cheating. I don't ever feel that way anymore. I've done my put my time in and uh, I would uh, I encourage my students now because some uh, students haven't kind of done any digital work. I say, you, you've got to learn this. It's not that I could do it and I'm not a computer person, but it's a pretty good interface and you can just kind of cut and paste and move things around and proportion things. So I'll photograph a painting while I'm doing it and I want to reproportion, I'll reproportion in Photoshop, look at the change and then apply that to the painting rather than some, obviously sometimes I'll resketch, but sometimes when it's more critical or I might be a big job, I will take the time to do that. And it's that ultimately saves time. It's a great sketching tool. And so I, I uh, it's really nice. I don't do much tablet work because I still like to draw on paper. I like the resistance. I don't like the slippery tablet so but but i do do cut and paste and uh, on all those reference photos you saw there was for those that you saw there was three times as many reference uh, photographs and collages digital collages to design it's fun to do because it's our time and uh, particularly in our postmodern period to kind of co uh, this collage kind of sensibility conceptually is the world we live in now so i think to design paintings i think it's a good idea so. Great. Any last question or comment, Denise? Oh, when I stick it on? Yeah. Mostly scale yeah. and proximity. So if it's closer, it could be a real thing. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And I always feel like the, the picture plane, the paintings coming forward at the base is getting nearer to you. So I, I, I have thicker paint and, and more sculptural. So the, the addition of collage will be uh, kind of touching those, I guess so. So yeah, and, 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 and most of the times that's when it starts to match the visual scale because that's close and we can see one-to-one, -one, but it's deep in the painting, things will be like the submarine will be like that. And so, so it's kind of, Kind of stuff like that. But yes, yeah, kind of a tactile decision uh, that way. And the things I find, I go around picking up bits of scraps like a magpie when I'm walking the dog. <laughs> it's like fascinating. I feel like a magpie. Oh, look at this wire. <laughs> all right. Great. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you all.